Our next one then is number 135. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia. Alleluia. Our final one just before the meeting starts is number 179. You're the word of God the Father. Um, you're the word of God the Father from the before the world began. Every star and every planet has been crafted by your hand.
Thank you to Robert for opening him tonight, his years I spent in vanity and pride. in a moment's prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together this evening. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank thee again that we're able to gather here together in this place and to be able to sound forth again the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're reminded this evening that before sin had ever entered in the world that God had a plan of redemption to send his one and only perfect son into this world and to die on a cross for sinners so that those who would put their faith and trust in him could have their sins forgiven and as if they had never sinned and one day go to heaven to be with him for all of eternity. Lord, what a wonderful message for those of us tonight, all of us who are born in sin and all of us without hope, but yet in Christ there is this hope of eternal life and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We pray tonight, Lord, your blessing upon solid ground as they've come and as they minister to us in song in a few moments. Bless each one of them. For Brother Paul, as he opens the scriptures to us, you can help him as he just shares the word that you've laid upon his heart and minister into the lives of each one here tonight. We've been thinking about this free mercy and free grace that God gives. We thank you that in mercy, Lord, you withhold the punishment which is our due for those who put their faith and trust in you. And not only that, but then, Lord, we have so much that is given to us, even eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and all of the things that we can become in Christ and through him. We pray tonight for the blessing upon us. We pray for the preaching of your word here and throughout our land tonight, and ask indeed that many may come to know and to love our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our brother Jack Ritchie tonight in Corridor, pray your blessing upon him. And for other faithful ministers of the word, May each one of them I just know your blessing upon their ministry tonight and the preaching of that same gospel of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that many may find the Saviour. So, Lord, we ask your continued blessing upon us now that you go with us 
and that you would glorify your great name, even through our time together, in your precious name. Amen. Well, it's a real blessing tonight. They have solid ground with us. I'm going to ask them to come and bring their first pieces to us. Thank you. We are absolutely delighted to be back with you here at the Iron Hall. I was having a wee look in my diary to see when it was we were last here, and it was January 2019. You could hardly believe that. Uh, so we're delighted to be here tonight. Two pieces just now. What a day that will be. I'm sure you'll know that piece, and I hope you're looking forward to that day when we see our Savior face to face. And that's all because of what was accomplished at Calvary. And the second piece is just simply entitled, Paid in Full. Thank you. 
ministry so far. We're looking forward again to hearing from you in just a few moments. Again, we're very glad to welcome back Paul Ferguson tonight to our pulpit and thank Paul for his ministry over this morning and last week as well and look forward to what he's going to share with us shortly. And just at the conclusion of this meeting tonight, everyone is encouraged and invited to remain behind. There will be some supper upstairs and there'll be a time when we'll be looking back, reflecting on the summer outreach that took place Various people were involved in various works, and we're going to hear just some feedback on that tonight. And you're all encouraged to remain behind if you can with us this evening, please. Tomorrow night, again, our Bible study, last in the series on the Olivet Discourse, and with David Moore, and please remember that. The rest of the things take place as planned and announced this morning. Just to highlight again that there is a nip and natter for the ladies at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. And we did mention this morning that our prayer meeting this week, we're going to be outlining some details in relation to the mission and it would be good if as many as possible were there and um, just to hear that and everything that we need to know and just to help us to pray intelligently for that let's continue to remember the mission of course and take whatever invitations you can distribute them to friends and family invite them along and pray again for brother john that during that week the lord will really work in the missing way just two weeks tonight it begins so let's really begin to sow some urgency again in prayer and inviting others Next Lord's Day, we meet to break bread at 10.30, and then at both 11.30, the family service, 7 o'clock, the gospel service. Hugh Martin will be the preacher, both occasions, and Jonathan Logan will be the soloist. So we're going to stand and sing together. Here is love, vast as the ocean. After that, solid ground are going to come and sing to us again, and then their brother Paul will come and open the scriptures to us.
is greater than all my sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than Thank you, solid ground for that message in song, and thank you once again for the invitation to the Iron Hall. I'd like to thank also our brother Hugh and his wife for having us for lunch. Hugh and Priscilla, I'm going to call them Aquila and Priscilla, but uh, they're certainly living up to the calling of Aquila and Priscilla. My wife said to me in the car on the way down the road, how you remember their names is H.P. Sauce, Hugh and Priscilla. So when you go to all these different churches, you often forget people's names. So I'm going to remember both their names for a long time. This morning, as we were here, uh, when I got home uh, this afternoon, I got a message from a pastor, who's a Chinese pastor from Singapore, who now lives in Sweden. And he sent me a picture of the service here, and he said, I've been watching your service from Sweden this morning here in the Iron Hall. So it's amazing where the broadcast get to all around the world. Well, let's turn in our Bibles this evening to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, we finished at the end of chapter 26 this morning with looking at the failure and the restoration of Simon Peter. And this evening we're going to contrast his repentance and restoration with the destruction and the failure to truly repent of the other disciple who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, Judas. And it says in verse 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. Amen. And God will bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for this important but also tragic story of the failure and the lack of true repentance of this man Judas and how he committed this terrible betrayal, died in such a terrible way and went off to a terrible eternity. May we learn from his mistakes his failure, and heed the warning of his life. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, if I was to ask the question this evening, what is the worst crime in the history of humanity? I'm sure I would get a number of responses. Some people might say the Holocaust. 
Others might describe some of the atrocities that happened in this country during what's called the Troubles. Well, all of those answers would be wrong because the worst crime, the worst betrayal in all of human history is the one found on the pages of this chapter. When Judas Iscariot, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, for three and a half years, walked with the Savior, ate with the Savior, talked with the Savior, witnessed all the miracles and the great sermons that he preached, then deliberately went out and betrayed the innocent Son of God, the sinless Son of God, for just a handful of pieces of silver. What a betrayal. What a crime. And Judas' story is a poignant example of the darkness and depravity of the human heart. It's a story we should pay careful attention to this evening in the Iron Hall. Now in verse 3 of Matthew 27, we discover that Judas recognized too late what he had done. He recognized that he had done the wrong thing. But you know, there are certain things in life that you cannot undo. We talk about spilt milk, spilling a jug of milk onto the earth. You can't get the milk back into the jug once it's gone. The consequences remain. And likewise, in the case of Judas, the consequence of his betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ couldn't be undone. And I know in verse 3 it says, when he saw that he was condemned, that's Christ, repented himself. Don't mistake the word repented there to mean that he genuinely repented of his sin and turned from it unto the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read on through the next seven verses, it's evident that he never truly repented of his sin. The word there has more the idea that he had remorse, that he was sorry for what he had done. He was sorry because for the first time it began to dawn on him that he had done a terrible thing. No doubt his conscience was pricking him of such a dark and terrible deed. As he looked at the money in his hand, it was as if it turned to blood, that blood money. And he realized that he had been tricked and played by the devil and the high priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. He'd been manipulated. And now he has a terrible dread of the consequences. No doubt he's afraid to die, afraid to face God, afraid to face the judgment of God for what he has done in betraying the innocent and the holy Son of God. And rather than repent, sad to say, he merely is remorseful. He's got this selfish dread of what's coming next for him in this life. And you know, that's where a lot of people go wrong in life. You'll meet people who are very remorseful over their sin, their choices. But remorse is not the same as true repentance. I was in a supermarket yesterday and I remember turning around and behind me was a politician. I'll not say his name in case you get in trouble. And this individual had got himself in trouble in the past and had to make a public apology for his behavior. But as I looked to my left and saw what he was bringing to the till, he had filled his trolley full of booze, and paracetamol, that's what he was going home to spend the evening on, the drink, because he has no true remorse. In fact, I read where he stated that he has no belief 
in any particular God or religion. How sad, how tragic that you can express remorse, regret for what you have done, but not have true repentance for what you have done. Peter, of course, we saw this morning, had true repentance. He didn't just weep bitterly. He was genuine in his sorrow. And his, in his grief and in his repentance, he came to Christ and sought the forgiveness of Christ. And when Christ forgave him, he sought to be restored and used of God. And Peter never did what he did that day in the city of Jerusalem again. He never betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. That's true repentance. Where you turn from your sin, you hate your sin, and you go out to live a different way. That's repentance. Remorse is where you just feel regret because you're ashamed of it. Remorse because you're ashamed of the public humiliation. You're ashamed because it's caused broken relationships between you and others. That's just remorse. It's not repentance. Many years ago, those of you who grew up in the 60s will remember a famous singer. He was called the king of rock and roll. His name was Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley, before he became famous, spent many years really learning how to sing, not in the pubs or the clubs, but in the churches. And he would sing, particularly in black churches, and he learned all those rhythms and moves, swaying with the black singers and the choirs in churches in the southern part of the United States. And Elvis wanted to be famous. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to be popular. And in many ways, he achieved all those things, didn't he? He had a wonderful voice that God gave him. He was a very handsome-looking man, tall and well-built. And he became very famous and popular and rich. But you know, Elvis got everything he thought would make him happy. But he discovered it did anything but make him happy. He turned to the drugs and the drink, trying to find a measure of happiness in his sad life. Elvis had a half-brother called Rick Stanley, a little bit younger than Elvis. And Rick used to hang around with his big brother. And he enjoyed the party, and the drink, and the drugs, and all the immorality that went with such a lifestyle. Until he also began to come under conviction of sin. One night he came to Elvis and he said to Elvis, My life's a mess. I'm so unhappy. He began to tell Elvis how he felt God was convicting him of his sin. Elvis looked at his younger half-brother and he said this to him. He says, you know, Rick, you're right. We're living the wrong way. And he said, it's time, it's time, he says, that we all, both of us, got serious about God. Got serious about God. Just 48 hours later, Elvis, although he said he was going to change, was found dead, pumped up with drugs, and after spending the night in all kinds of immoral sins. His brother Rick thought about what had happened to Elvis and just a few days later instead of simply being remorseful he repented of his sin instead of becoming a singer like his big brother he became a preacher 
said that he preached in 4,000 different churches and meetings all around America for the next 20 to 30 years. What do we see in the contrast of the two brothers? One, remorse. The other, true repentance. And you know, that's the decision all of us have to make this evening. Maybe you're here tonight like Judas, like Elvis. You're sorry for your sin. You're sorry for the broken relationships. You're sorry because you still have a guilty conscience that keeps throbbing, keeps warning you. You're sorry because you're afraid to die. You're afraid to face God. You have this dread of eternity. But all of those things will not save you, will not get you one inch closer to heaven. Judas had all of that, but he never made it to heaven. Because true repentance is much deeper than simply being sorry for your sins, sorry for being caught in your sins, sorry for being caught out and shamed and humiliated for your sin. Sorry for all the consequences that flows of, of broken relationships and friendships because of your sin. That's not repentance. Peter had repentance. Judas had not. But there's one good thing that came out of Judas's remorse. In verse 4, he went to the chief priests and elders with the 30 pieces of silver and he said this, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Even in this confession, Matthew is letting us know that even the one who betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ knew he was innocent, confessed he was innocent in a very public way. And those who he betrayed Christ to had no answer to that confession. But then, in verse 5, what will Judas do? We're told he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. What a tragedy. You know, if you were to examine the life of Judas tonight, you would be amazed at the privileges this man had. Unlike most people who've ever lived, Judas was privileged to walk with Christ for three and a half years. He saw the blind receive their sight. He saw the dead raised to life. He saw the lepers cured. He heard all those sermons, those wonderful sermons, from the one whose mouth was full of grace and truth. Heard them all. He witnessed as Jesus Christ faced down every hostile force. He witnessed as Jesus Christ never said a word that he had to apologize for. Never had to express regret for anything he had done. For three and a half years under the great pressure of such a ministry and such hostility that Christ faced, Judas witnessed that he never lost his temper once in a sinful anger. What a witness that must have been to Judas. He saw how Christ took on the hostile questioning of the scribes and Pharisees who, who plotted and planned all different ways to trip him up. And he saw how wise Jesus was. How patient he was. How forbearing he was. And for three and a half years, Judas had a ringside seat at the feet of the master. He saw all these things, but he still turned his back on the Savior. What a crime. What a terrible life that he lived. Now, what is the response to those that he confessed his wrongdoing to? We're told 
after he brought the 30 pieces of silver, he said to them, I have sinned, verse 4, in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. What's their response? And they said, what is that to us? See thou to it. In other words, they said to Judas, we don't care. We don't care. Not our problem. It's your problem. We don't care he's innocent. We don't care that you feel sorry about it. It's your problem. Now remember, these are the religious leaders. These are the ones that are meant to be the spiritual pastors of this nation. The ones who boasted that they are Abraham's seed, that they are the chosen people. And among the nation of Israel, they were the chosen few to lead them in paths of righteousness. And yet when Judas came and confessed his sin, they just said to him, not our problem. Not our problem. Get out of here. Don't want anything more to do with you. And you know, that's so true of the devil and the devil's crowd, isn't it? They'll draw you into the sin and then they'll leave you lying in the gutter in sin. Do you remember the story of the first couple who fell into sin in this world? Adam and Eve. Do you remember how the devil came to approach them? He came as a friend, didn't he? He came trying to pretend he was on their side. Trying to entice them into sin by arguing with Eve that God's not fair. That God wants to restrict your freedom, Eve. That God's jealous of you because if you take the fruit, you'll be like him. And Eve, foolishly, fell for the lie of the devil. The Bible tells us she took the fruit. She ate it. She gave it to him, Adam. But you notice what happens after they ate the fruit? They began to realize the guilt. A conscience began to throb for the first time. A dread of sin began to rise in their hearts and in their minds. And where was the devil? Their supposed friend. Nowhere to be seen. Oh, he's no help then. After drawing them into sin, leading them in the paths of destruction, he abandons them. Leaves them lying, as we could say, in the gutter. To face the judgment of God alone. And here the scribes and the Pharisees. When Judas turns up at their door. And he says. I I've sinned. And I, I've, I want to return this money. No doubt Judas thought if he gave the money. That somehow it would quell his conscience. Maybe God would forgive him. If he did a good deed. Didn't keep the money. Of course, the devil and the devil's disciples have no time for him. He says, what is that to us? Go on, get out of here. Judas threw down the money. And he left. And we had out to destroy himself. But notice what they do next. Verse 6. After they had heard of Judas's death, his suicide. It says, the chief priest took the silver pieces... And said, oh, you're going to see the really religious people talking now. The real hypocrites and self-righteous. And they said, it is not lawful. You almost can hear them putting on that posh accent. You know, maybe they're from Cherry Valley or somewhere like that. It is not lawful. It is not lawful. It is not lawful for, to put them into the treasury. Because it is the price of blood. God's law doesn't allow us to take blood money. And just put it into the offering basket. Because God's offering basket is holy. And it couldn't be contaminated by blood money like this. Of course they ignored who was it who gave the money. Who made it blood money. It was themselves. 
But you know, we can be so self-righteous over other people's sins. Isn't that right? We ignore our own. If you turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now I realize in the case of the scribes and Pharisees, these people were unsaved. But even believers who are backslidden can become so self-righteous over other people's sins. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 12, King David fell into a terrible sin. They murdered a man. And took his wife. For nine months, he just pretended that all was well until the birth of the baby. And no doubt David would have intended to live on like that if God hadn't have come round to his house through Nathan. Nathan came and he told David a story of a rich man and a poor man. He just told David that the rich man had many, many flocks of sheep. But the poor man had just one little lamb. And remember, David was a shepherd before he was a king. And no doubt that story really touched David's and the heart of David. Maybe brought him back to his younger days when he was just a young boy running on the hills of Bethlehem with just a few sheep. When David heard the story of how the rich man, instead of touching one of his sheep and using that to feed his visitors, took the little lamb, the only lamb of the poor man, and killed it and ate it. David was so outraged. In fact, it says, when David heard the story, in verse 5, his anger was greatly kindled. Oh, he wasn't just angry. He was furious. And as king, he makes a statement. As the Lord liveth. He took an oath in Jehovah's name. As God lives. He says, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Now, it wasn't a capital offense. If you stole a sheep or a lamb, under the law of Israel, it wasn't a death sentence. You had to restore what you had stolen. Certainly was a far smaller crime, far lesser crime, than what David had done in not just taking another man's wife, but murdering that man. But David, so self-righteous, so caught up, in his own sense of holiness and justice, he says, the man that did it shall die. Die today. Surely die. In other words, no, his, there's no hope of mercy for such an individual. In verse 6, he says, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Oh, David was so outraged at other people's sins that he wanted them to pay not just a little, but he wanted to take everything from them, to destroy them. And little did David know the moment he was saying those things, that Nathan had the sword of the spirit one inch from his heart. And as soon as David finished speaking, he plunged it in and he said, Thou art the man. You're the one. You're the guilty one. For you did it when you took Uriah and had him murdered and took his wife Bathsheba. David suddenly realized, I've sinned. It's me. I'm guilty. But these scribes and Pharisees who were so proud of their ancestry to Abraham and to David, there's no repentance like that from them. And they get all self-righteous and they said, we, we, we couldn't use this blood money to just put into the treasuries. What would people think of us if they hear? And they said, well, do you know what we'll do? Verse 7, they took counsel. You can imagine they had a big committee meeting. How can we cover this up? 
and make ourselves look good in public. And they came up with what they thought was a very innovative solution. They said, we'll take the money and we'll buy a field so that those who are so poor that they can't afford their own burial plot can be buried in it. Strangers or the very poor, the destitute, they, they can have their own plot. And everybody will hear about the generosity of we, the scribes and Pharisees, and they'll praise us, no doubt, for doing a good deed. They say positive words about you. And verse 8 tells us that's what they did. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. The infamy of what they had done now remained permanent as a testimony against them. The field of blood, the blood money that they gave to Judas. And the Bible says that was fulfilled, verse 9, that which was spoken by Jeremiah or Jeremy the prophet saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord had appointed. You know, isn't it ironic? These people who claimed to know the Bible were actually fulfilling the Bible by their sinful actions. How blind, how foolish, how stupid were these people. But you know, I want to wrap this up this evening by saying this. Both the scribes and the Pharisees and Judas destroyed themselves that day. Judas in particular destroyed not just his testimony and his life by hanging himself, but Judas destroyed his soul because he went out into God's eternity, lost forever. He went out into God's eternity knowing he had betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing he had sinned. Knowing that he had to face the judgment for his sin. But unlike Peter, whose sin drew him to the Savior, Judas's sin drew him to suicide and despair. What a contrast between the two men. One was drawn to repent. The other simply had remorse and found no true repentance for his sin. And my question to you this evening is this. Was Peter any more a sinner or less a sinner than Judas? No, both were sinners. Did Peter betray the Lord Jesus Christ like Judas betrayed? Yes, he did. Both betrayed him. In fact, in Peter's case... He did it many times, over and over. Did Peter deserve to go to hell? Yes, he did. Did Judas? Yes, he did. But why is Peter in heaven and Judas in hell? Was it because Peter was a better man? No. It's because Peter truly repented of his sin. Judas refused to repent of his sin. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ said this of Judas. Listen to what he said. Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. That's what Jesus said. Better that he wasn't even born. Because if a child dies before it comes to the fullness of birth, at least that child would go to heaven. But in Judas's case, there's no hope. He's lost. And he's lost forevermore. And he has to bear the scars and the consequences of his sin forevermore. And never forget this. Judas was one of the 12 disciples. 
Judas was the treasurer of the first band of the disciples. Judas walked with Christ for three and a half years. He saw the miracles. He heard the sermons. He saw the wisdom, the patience, the love of Christ. And yet, despite all of those things, he went to hell. Maybe you're here this evening and you've grown up in church. You know all the vocabulary. You know when to stand and when to sit. You know how to sing the hymnal. Maybe you even know many of the hymns by memory. Maybe you know many of the verses of the Bible. You've been taught them in the Sunday school, in the youth fellowship, in the church. I remember a lady in Singapore came to the church that I was helping out in. Very intelligent lady, a medical doctor. And just after I had arrived, they had a competition for scripture memorization, and she won the prize. And I was asked to present her the prize, and before I did, one of the elders of that church said to me, you know, this lady's not saved. She's not saved. And after the service was over, I was talking to her, and I said to her, can I ask you a question? Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And without blinking, she looked at me and she says, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I said, well, can I ask you another question? Why are you not a Christian? She looked at me and she said, I don't want to talk about it. I said, well, can, is there something in your life? She said, I don't want to talk about it. She repeated, I don't want to talk about it. Not long after that, she left the church. Never saw her again. The old lady who knew the Bible, knew, knew many of the verses of the Bible, yet was lost. I was telling someone today about a young man I knew growing up when I was a boy. His father was a pastor of a church. And his mother was very diligent to teach them the word of God. And this young boy, as a child, could memorize chapters of the Bible. And if he used any rude words or talked back, the mother was one of those old-fashioned mothers. She would put soap in his mouth to teach him a lesson. Not long ago, his father passed away. The son came to the funeral of the father and stood up and gave a speech and praised the father's life and was able to quote Bible verses and uh, use all the vocabulary of the Christian faith. The son has become very successful in life because there is one thing he loved more than the faith of his parents, and that was money. He not only became a millionaire, he became a billionaire. Imagine. Owns a very big company. Offices all around the world. And yet at the father's funeral, he could quote the Bible, and he had all the phrases. But if you were to ask him, are you saved? He'll tell you, no, I'm not. Remember what Jesus said? What shall it profit the man if he shall gain the world and lose his own soul? Judas gained a few pieces of silver. That young man I'm describing, he's not a young man anymore. He's gained the millions, indeed the billions. But he's lost his soul. Lost his soul. Can't trade your soul for the billions or the millions or the pieces of silver. Remember what the old hymn writer said, now none but Christ can satisfy. None but Christ can satisfy. And Judas is a classic illustration 
of the lost opportunity, the missed opportunity, of the man who was showered with the privileges of God and yet turned his back on it and went out into God's eternity. Why is so much space given to Judas in the Bible? You ever wondered that? The Holy Spirit didn't make a mistake when he put all that information about Judas, all that biographical information about Judas. Why has God put all that information about Judas to warn you this evening not to be like him, not to walk in his footsteps, not to be a Judas? Today, nobody calls their child Judas. You ever noticed? His name lives on through eternity as a name of infamy, a name of reject. Don't be a Judas. Don't be a fool. Don't simply be remorseful for what you have done. Be a Peter. Weep over your sin. Be sorry for your sin, yes, but come to the Savior. And the good news is this. I saw your text outside as I was coming in. He says, well, come on to me. That's what Jesus says. Come on to me. Don't come to the church. Don't come to the high priest. Don't come to the world. Don't come to the counselor. Don't come to the publican. For they can't give you any peace. Come to the Savior. And he says what? He that cometh unto me, I will in no wise, no wise, cast out. If you're here tonight and you're feeling the conviction of God in your life, don't be a Judas. Be a Peter and get right with God. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for this thy word this evening. It's a very solemn subject about a very solemn subject ending of a man called Judas. Help us not to be like him. Help us to be a David and truly repent. Help us to be a Peter. And when God speaks to us, God convicts us, may we be willing to fully and absolutely and freely say, I have sinned. Forgive my sins. I want to turn away from my sin. For we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our closing hymn is a hymn that tells us that Jesus is only a step away. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Don't have to go on a long journey to get saved. Don't have to read a lot of books. Some religions you have to read all these volumes and go through all these rituals in order to get to what they call heaven or paradise or find some measure of forgiveness. But the good news is Jesus Christ is here tonight and he's only a step away. King David says there's only a step between me and death. But thank God between that step to death, there's Jesus. He's only a step away. Come to him. Let's stand as we sing 273.
benediction of blessing. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace in the God of love and peace shall be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.